Hello and welcome to the Muscle Engineer Podcast. I am your host Sotak Andre and this is episode 13. And before we get into the episode itself, I have a couple of um, announcements and clarifications to make. First off, I want to apologize for the lack of episodes in the last, I don't know, it's been probably three, maybe even four weeks. I have a very good reason for that uh, lack of episode. No, I haven't forgotten about the podcast and uh, it's definitely a high priority of mine and something I absolutely love doing, but the podcast is not paying any bills. So this is just a fun uh, side project and hobby for me right now. So if you know me personally and have been following me on social media and whatnot, uh, you would know that I have been working with... um, well, I guess interning with Renaissance Periodization, the company Mike Israel and uh, Nick Show founded since, uh, I guess, August last year or something like that. And I have been helping them out with uh, various projects and mainly doing infographics for them. So if you've seen the infographics on the RP Strength Instagram or Facebook page, most of those are made by me. And uh, what's happened a good month ago is that... Um, I started taking on online clients for coaching under the supervision of Mike Israel, which uh, in, is in and, of, in and of itself a super cool thing. But this also meant that I had to work on setting the clients up and um, writing the programs and whatnot. So that took a lot of my time. Aside from that, I also had my exam session. I'm currently enrolled in a master's uh, degree. And I've had exams and whatnot, and that's something I am honestly currently right now thinking about um, quitting, honestly, because I'm not planning on doing any sort of a former job where the masters itself would help me out, and uh, the information itself is definitely not not worth the hassle, I guess. Right now, the assignments and exams and whatnot are just simply taken away from actually learning stuff I I can benefit from and um, working with clients and putting out content like this. So another thing that happened is that I moved because the place I lived was a bit far away from my gym and um, I lost a lot of time commuting. So I moved to a place that's much closer right now, but it's also in a bit noisier place and I still haven't set up my room so if the intro and the outro we have some sort of an echo it will be because I am in that new uh, room and um, I will have to make some sort of adjustments to somehow improve the audio quality but uh, by the time I record new episodes that should be sorted out so it should be no big deal okay I think uh, those will take care of the all the announcements i wanted to make i apologize again for the lack of episodes but i promise that uh, i will not be slacking anymore and i will continue bringing you guys awesome guests and um, awesome and valuable episodes so with that out of the way let's get into today's episode which is again number 13 in which i'm joined by dr scott stevenson the man behind 42 training and um Honestly, someone that's, uh, I guess, legendary in the field, if I may call it him that. He has been training for, geez, almost four decades, and uh, he's just a wealth of knowledge. Like I mentioned in the episode itself, he has not only the practical experience, but he also has a PhD, so he definitely has the academic side ticked off too. We actually sat down and we talked for like three hours and we got through, I guess, a third of the (laughs) questions I wanted to bring up, so we will definitely have a part two. But for now, this is the first part of the first conversation I am going to have with uh, Scott. In this episode, we discuss Scott's background, we discuss DC training or duck crap training, as was coined by Dante Trudel, how that has influenced Scott's own 42 training. And we also dive pretty deeply into conversation around muscle fiber types and hyperplasia and whether it happens in humans or not. And we discuss some advanced uh, training methods such as muscle rounds and uh, widowmaker sets. So without further ado, let's get into episode 13 of the Muscle Engineer podcast with Dr. Scott Stevenson. Dr. Scott Stevenson, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you bringing me on here. Yeah, my pleasure, and thank you for joining me on such a short notice. You know, um, actually, we kind of postponed this because of the holidays, but I don't think I've, I don't, I never say no to a podcast. It's a chance to help people out and educate and do, like, this is whole, my whole purpose with um, being in the fitness industry is to try to disseminate some good information, so 
this is this is what it's all about for me so this is perfect yeah definitely and um i think it would be nice for the people who maybe not know you to give them some background on you so could you please let us know just briefly about your uh, formal education background and your involvement in bodybuilding so the the story the scott stevenson story uh, it's the typical one i didn't get sand kicked in my face but um i just even long before i started i started training when i was 12 and even long before that i wanted to i had i wanted to do martial arts and there was no place in my hometown in a small town in illinois to do that and my mom thought that weight training would stunt my growth so she wouldn't let me do it until i got into junior high school where we could start and uh, i was just a, a plate head i was just a meathead reading muscle and, even collected the muscle and fitness magazines thinking i would have like this valuable repertoire i had this valuable library of of uh, literature you know to pull from in the future i still have some of those old ones just for shits and grins and uh, I went through college and was trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to do. I, we just were talking about this. I was a physics and German double major and didn't figure out what I could do with that. But I knew I loved working out. I was just, that was just a passion of mine. So I went to grad school, figured out I liked to teach, um, ended up getting a PhD in exercise physiology. Uh, it was like 99 or so. So a ways, ways back now. And um, I also wanted to help people along the way. So I ended up being a licensed acupuncturist and did that for a while when I lived in Arizona. So I have somewhat of a, a Western academic background and an alternative medicine background as well. I blend those things when I can. It's You can't really do much with online clients, which is who I work with mostly. You can't, you can't make prescriptions for herbs and those sorts of things. It's illegal actually in some cases to do that. Uh, so, I, but I, I do take a lot of that background information and corporate when I can. And, um, I just spent the last, I've been training for, I'm 47 now, so kind of do the math. We're getting up over 35 years here. Wow. Yeah, I've been competing for over 20 now, or about 20 years. Started competing when I was in graduate school, actually, for the first time, and had to hide it because there's sort of a, a the culture there is that you have to, your work ethic have to, has to be outstanding. So anything that would take you away from the lab this sort of a no-no sort of frowned upon. And of course, I'm, I'm at a, and this, my advisor didn't feel this way, but some of the other, it wasn't said explicitly with the sort of the, 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 the nod was that, mm, nah, you really shouldn't be doing, mess around with that sort of thing. So I had to kind of hide that I was, you know, training when I was started getting lean. And uh, for my first competition, I was wearing clothes to completely cover up so no one would notice, <laughs> literally. Um, and uh, I got the bug. I was someone who got the bug. So I just kept on doing it. And it's just a, it's a tinkering learning process for me that I really enjoy. So you essentially did what uh, the opposite of what most guys do instead of trying to show off everything you kind of had to cover up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I've never, I, I like to, I, I've always likened this. Um, people have listened to other podcasts. I, I've used this analogy before. I've kind of likened it to someone who's um, like a muscle car uh, fanatic and he, he likes to come home and go into his um, garage and tinker on the muscle car. And you have to leave it revealed so that you can see what you're doing. So you can, you know, get a, an idea of what the whole car is, is uh, coming into being. But you don't necessarily drive it all over the place because it's, it's, it's basically for your own um, satisfaction. It's, it's intrinsically valuable just to do that. That's sort of why you value it. A lot of guys, not all of them, many guys that I know, a lot of big guys, um, of course, there's some variability here. And I'm kind of in this camp is it's nice when someone recognizes you in public as being sort of a big guy, a muscular guy. And I actually have a great time. I get asked so many strange questions. The guys know all the, all the bizarre ones. Um, I have a good time interacting with people, but there have been times when, you know, you just want to be sort of invisible. You don't want to have to uh, have people staring at you wherever you're walking. So staying covering up is covered up is how I prefer to be most of the time. I have a, a we'll talk about fortitude training today, I think. And I've got a promo video I made and it just so happened, uh, a guy was filming me, and I think I'm, I think I'm doing tricep press downs a, at the time, and somebody walks past in the background, and this is at a gym I've never trained at, so I'm a, also a new guy there, and he walks by, and the guy like turns his head, and like he has like this wide-eyed look. It's sort of funny, you can catch that. It's about, I don't know, 40 seconds into the video. I've known people who love that. They relish that being gawked at. You know, that's, that's you know, how their ego is, is constructed. And they like that. And it does give you some feedback, but I guess I'm just more of a naturally shy guy in a way. 
probably has something to do with my upbringing and my parents and my proclivity. I'm the same way. I I don't even take selfies in the locker when someone is in there because I just I feel ashamed that when I'm taking photos of myself. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't feel that way. I'm not embarrassed by the photos and that sort of thing so much. Um, it do, it does. There is so many so much egotistical and narcissistic behavior in bodybuilding. Obviously, it's all about your physique. It's all about you. And that was kind of the point I was making with the with the car is that it's a slippery slope. And it's a, an interesting thing that I've, you know, pondered for many, many years now is that is that that body, that's sort of how our ego constructs our worldview is that we are sort of our locus of consciousness is in some um, sort of imaginary point in our heads that's looking out through our eyeballs and that our body is really a large part of who and what we are. And, you know, our self-esteem is wrapped up in it. We have a body image, especially in Western cultures. You know, that's so important. We have an individualistic culture in the West where, you know, the individual is sort of put on a premium. And so who you are is what you look like, you know, and your personal beauty and those sorts of things are, can be so strongly stereotyped that it's easy to fall into that trap to think, oh, my God, this is this is the typical bodybuilding mindset or very sort of the stereotypical one, you might say, where, you know, I, I start I want to cover up once I'm, you know, four pounds or five pounds over my contest body fat level um, because I look horrible. And it's just no, it's just that's part of the process. So disidentifying from that. Actually, as far as bodybuilding goes, can be one of the most important things for someone to do, because if you really want to make progress, for instance, in the off season, in many cases, you may need you have to let go of, you know, being absolutely shredded to the bone like you would be on on stage day, on contest day. So it's a tough thing to do to be entirely focused on your physique in the way that that makes progress, but at the same time able to see the forest from the trees and stand back with the right perspective that's required to um, sort of uh, take an objective or a scientific um, perspective and approach to things. So um, my girlfriend actually asked me who am I going to have on and I said someone that probably has been training longer than I have been alive <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm only 23 so that was quite uh, an understatement. Yeah sometimes I, I get asked um, in the gym you know uh, how long you've been training. And it depends on the circumstances. Um, there was a funny exchange I had with a guy I saw in the gym a couple of weeks ago. It was a young guy. And um, he walked by me and he just saw me. And I was, I think I just finished a set. So I was breathing pretty hard. And, um, you know, I was, I was pumped up from the set and I was going to get some water. He's like, he's like, first day in the gym. I'm like, I just signed up. This place is awesome. You should have seen me a week ago. <laughs> and so we like we every time we walk past each other, you know, we, we were joking like that. It was really kind of fun. But sometimes I do say, you know, I've been probably training longer than you've been alive. Um, so this didn't happen, you know, overnight, so to speak. I actually did a podcast with Eric Drexler around the whole fat free mass index issue and whether you can use that as an anti limit. And there are guys who compete as a natural with a 28 FFMI. For wow. example, the guy who yeah, the guy who won the WMBF, I think it was WMBF Worlds, the mm -hmm. heavyweights, um, Sam Watt, he was a hundred kilos at six feet tall, so one eighty three centimeters. Wow. Yeah, in contest shape, absolutely. Yeah, shredded, in I'm contest sure. shape. Yeah. yeah, that's yep. just <laughs> insane. But what can you do? I mean, it is I've, what it is. I told the story. I've told this before. I think on the Muscle Minds podcast that I do. I know I told it someplace. I was going into my senior year playing football in high school, and we were doing the uh, bench press testing, just testing the the new uh, the new players. All the teams were being tested, and there was a guy who was going out for football, so he was going into the eighth grade this time. He may have been held back a year, but you know he wasn't. Um, he was you know probably no older than like fourteen or fifteen, but he was a big kid. He was a really big kid. He was a muscular kid, and he never lifted before. He was super duper shy. And so this is the eighth grader. So they just were doing group bench press testing and they lied, lied down. They had like, you know, everyone warmed up with the bar or whatever. They're just bringing them in like there's a group of 20 of them at a time. And they started with like 95 pounds and he didn't even know what to do. He lies down. The bar was like all on one side and he just goes to grab it all, all, all off balance. Like, no, no, no. You got to use, see those little notches, these little, the knurling notches here in the bar. You use those. He's like, oh, okay. So he, he lowers the bar down. It's all kind of wobbly and it goes to his chest and it comes back up. 
And it's like, okay, good. You got it. So they go to 115, 115 pounds. They go to 135. Each of them looks the same. They go to 185. People start falling off. They go to, uh, they start bringing in the ninth graders and the sophomores um, and the juniors. And so these guys are working and he's still in there. They go to 225. You know, now some of the seniors are starting to fall off too. They go to 275. He gets it. He pressed 365 the first time he ever bench pressed <laughs> as, as an incoming eighth grader. And he may have been held back. I don't know. He was so big. He's a big kid. But that, regardless, I don't care if he's a full-grown man, you know, or a kid. That's, yeah. an, that's like Bill Kazmaier type strength. I hear he, you know, he did something like that the first time he lifted. Just, so there's, there's baseline genetic strength and muscle mass. Who knows what that guy could have done? He didn't play football as far as I know, but just a monster. Yeah, the first time I tried messing around with weights at a friend's place, uh, the bar buried me. <laughs> so I dropped 20 kilos on my chest. So that tells you something. You've got a, Your starting point isn't exactly awesome. So relative progress is probably, this is another thing I mentioned in that talk, but and I'll say it again because it's so important, is that in order to gain information about what, a, what applies to you as a lifter, look for the people that have traveled the path that's most likely to be the one you're going to take. So, you know, if someone starts off without much muscle mass, with, without an impressive physique, that just naturally that's how they're put together and they're pretty weak, and then they double their strength and increase their muscle mass by 75% over the course of 10 years, and it's a cr slow process that they've had to, like, you know, fight tooth and nail for, that's impressive. You know, someone who goes in the gym, I, mean, I know a, a guy, he's actually passed on now, he's a pro, who was a, a sprinter for the New Zealand Olympic team. So right there, he's got good genetics. He had a knee injury, started training with weights to bring his, his to rehab his, his knee, and then he said, well, I might as well do some upper body stuff, and he found he really liked weight training. He gained 50 pounds in the first six months lifting weights, seriously. Jesus. So he just decided to go for it. He couldn't run, he just like, he, he, he just buried himself into that. And then, and then he decided he was going to add some steroids to the mix. And he gained another 50 pounds the next six months. He gained 100 pounds in his first year of serious weight training. Now that's genetics. Like that's a lifetime, you know, for most people or more. He did it in the one year. So that, that guy, you can't just do what that guy did and expect it necessarily going to apply to you. That's not the path that some people could take. That's more than a lifetime with drugs. <laughs> yeah, that's, he was, I mean, I, I remember he sent me long ago, he sent me a picture of him next to Ronnie Coleman, and they were about the same size off season. He's a huge dude, so. Yeah, life is, life is what it is. Yeah, deal with the cards that you were dealt. So the reason I wanted to have you on, because um, you're one of the select few who not only has the practical experience like we discussed, but you also have the theoretical knowledge, because... I've met people who have either <laughs> either one of those and both of them is a bad idea because if you don't have the training experience, then you kind of tend to make <laughs> make up some theoretical training plans or whatever that makes sense in your head. But anyone who trained a couple of months would tell you that's just <laughs> not feasible. And the other way around is just, it's kind of more obvious because when people don't have the theoretical knowledge, they just kind of find all kinds of explanations to explain things that, that they happen to them. So Yeah, so, uh, you know, as a comment on that, if someone is, is really um, particular and sort of scientific-minded but lacks the formal education, they can figure out some things really well. And if they're, if they're sort of smart enough, you might say, to recognize that they're just putting together bullshit reasons for why things might have worked, um, they're not trying to, like, bro science their way through an explanation, those people who have been in the trenches can have phenomenal, phenomenal. I mean, here, here's, here's someone, and he does have some of, somewhat of a scientific background, but, but Chris Aceto is a, is a hell of a coach. He's one of the best ever. There's, I don't think anyone would doubt that. And, but he, and he actually did train quite a bit. And he does have, um, he, was, he was a USA competitor. There's videos you can find. So he, he has some in the trenches experience, but, but he, doesn't try to, he doesn't try to science his way through things. He feels his way through things. He does it in an intuitive way, and he's really, really, really good. And he's not like thinking about you know refilling muscle glycogen levels per se. He's just thinking about filling out the muscles. So you can tell by how he talks his way through through things. He's just a smart, intelligent guy. So um, yeah, I think there's some synergy with the combination. But if you're really good at what you do, on the other hand, a really good scientist who recognizes and reads into the limitations of the study 
won't try to say, well, you know, no science shows a lack of evidence doesn't necessarily mean an evidence of lack of, infra, of, of some particular effect. So you have to read the, the information really, really closely in the scientific literature and understand its limitations before you can start sort of overextending those findings. That's what a lot of, I see a lot of that on the internet, it seems like. Even sometimes good scientists will do that as is not they don't know enough about the trenches to recognize that the the in the lab experience um, falls short in some way. So we can talk more about that when we get into it. But there's a, there's a lot to be said there actually. That's a really fascinating topic because it comes up a lot. Oh yeah, definitely. And the issue is when we have scientific evidence that well um, tends to indicate one thing, and uh, then just someone simply doesn't acknowledge that or simply isn't aware of that and one example is the um, squats increase testosterone and that means that uh, squatting will get you bigger arms or something like that <laughs> on the surface level it makes sense if you have no previous back knowledge or you're not aware of any scientific studies that have investigated this it makes sense right squats are compound movement and it's hard so they increase testosterone <laughs> yeah well, i mean that's actually been been studied um directly there's a there's a few studies. I don't know if you're aware of these, but they what they've yeah. done, yeah, is, is do the squats to elevate growth hormone levels, testosterone levels, and um, under one condition they do those before doing arm training, and then on the other condition they do it without the arm training. So you might I think that in these there's they've used different protocols, but someone might come into the lab, train an arm, uh, maybe maybe they do alternating days. So one day you train just the left arm, and the other day you come in and you train the legs before training the right arm. So the right arm is trained under the exposure of the elevation of endogenous hormones because of the previous leg work that was done. And um, there's only one study that shows any effect. Most of them don't. Stu Mitchell's done a good good bit of this stuff. Um, sorry, Stu, Stu Phillips. Stu and Phillips, Mitch, yeah. Yeah, Mitchell is one of his co-authors, one of his students. I'm thinking of some other stuff that I was just reading. But on the other hand, there's, there's a good connection there. Someone who's, who's, who's willing to squat and squat hard is someone who's willing to train hard. You've automatically selected for people who are willing to push themselves in the gym. And that's a key ingredient for making progress. Someone who doesn't want to squat, whether or not squat's the best, a, a, a good leg exercise for them, if they're willing to get on the bar and squat, which is one of the hardest things to do in the gym, and take those sets close to failure or even to, to failure, you've automatically biased your subject selection for people who are going to make better gains in their arm, arm muscles. It may have nothing to do with elevation of endogenous hormones, but you've got a scientific limitation there because you don't have random sampling of your subjects in that way. So you can view that from a scientific perspective. And I mean, not that I'm like the, you know, the most scientifically minded guy in the world, but that's some of that just basic scientific theory that gets overlooked is the limitations of, of uh, what you have. You're not conducting you know, um, random selection of subjects in the gym. You've got all sorts of factors to determine who will do what. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, actually. And uh, particularly one that comes to mind is the Morton study. I'm sure you've seen it. Neither load nor hormones determine hypertrophic outcomes is something like that, the mm -hmm. title. It's, I think, a year or two ago now. Anyway, that investigated this topic. Um, and yes, yeah, two had some older studies as well. But uh, your point, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly interesting, interesting perspective. I guess, but I'm simply talking when someone, let's say they have a weak uh, body part, which happens to be arms and they should start doing more arm work instead of doing more squats, thinking that that's going to give them a better arm growth. But I definitely see your point. And <laughs> that's interesting. There's so many things too, if you look, I mean, just look at what someone's doing if they're squatting. Like for instance, I don't, I, I, I barbell squat, but I use usually an attachment called a top squat that, that Dave Draper makes. Um, yeah, I've people, seen that. Yeah, it's great um, because otherwise my shoulders get screwed up and I, a lot of people end up getting some biceps tendonitis. One thing I would do is really strongly contract my arms during my squats, just keeping the bar in place because the weight would get heavy. A squat really kind of hits everything. And same thing can be true of heavy leg pressing, depending on the leg press you're in. You may have to really, really hold on tight to um, keep yourself in the leg press if you've got that thing loaded up. So someone who's training arms twice a week, uh, and now they start doing heavy leg pressing, heavy leg work, they're getting, they're getting a, light, a lighter load, a, an isometric contraction during their squats 
and during their leg press. They're actually getting arm training in there. That can come from that, from doing those sorts of things. There are guys, you know, that won't, will stop training their arms, and when they gain weight, and just because they're doing heavy deadlifts and those sorts of things, their arms will grow. Because your arms are getting, I mean, there's a reason why people pull biceps when they're doing deadlifts a lot. <laughs> you just see just about as many, some of it's because of the alternating grip. But there's some stress there on that muscle. So just the leg, that's another thing that people might not consider is, you know, in, another, gosh, if someone else is doing too much arm work, and now they decide, well, I'm going to drop my arm training down and now do leg training. Now they've, now they've settled themselves back into a, a more optimal training frequency or overall weekly training volume by doing two versus three or four workouts because they've added the leg training in there and recognize they just can't, you know, just adding on training volume and get away with it. And now the reason that they're getting better arm growth is because they reduced their arm training, not necessarily because they added leg training. So there's all those sorts of things to think about, you know. Yeah, that's the reason why I try to, usually if I can manage, I try to not include any direct arm work for beginners, usually. Right. If I can, up to a year or so, especially for females, because they're not interested in arm growth specifically. So no. any indirect work they get is plenty. Right. Yeah. So I've seen a post of yours on Facebook in which you shared a video of someone criticizing DC training and... Um, I've seen Dante comment that uh, you're one of the most uh, well-equipped people to actually comment on DC training. And I'm sure that it had uh, an influence on your training uh, routine and setup and for the developing 42 training. So could you please dive in a bit on uh, what is DC training and uh, what are some of the most common misconceptions people might have around it? Yeah, so <laughs> DC training is dog crap training. It's Dante Trudell's uh, invention. He didn't know when he came up with that name. He, he wanted to be uh, anonymous on a long since defunct message board. So he just came up with the, uh, the screen name dog crap and started putting forth his ideas. And most people figure out who he was just because his writing style. He would write in all caps and in certain ways. You can just tell it's Dante. It's very unique. So uh, the gig was up pretty quick, but the dog crap moniker stuck because that thread grew over to be over 100 pages. And he just set forth this training um, regime, which is now kind of what, what you call dog crap training. And um, many, many, many people did it over the years. I had come to do, when I found out about it, just from being on the boards, I've been doing almost everything he had in there except for the rest pause sets which are a type of cluster set. So I was training in very much the same way. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Like this is basically just a, and I hadn't been doing the stretches in that way. I hadn't been doing the extreme stretches either, but the duration of the blasts, um, the training split, um, the exercise selection, sort of the, uh, the focus on progressive overload, even the rep ranges for the, the heavy sets, those were the things that I had been doing already. So so basically DC training is um, a very progressive, it's a, it's a a bare bones, knuckle down, and rely upon the fact that if you're eating enough to bring about muscle growth and you're training in a progressive overload manner, that if you get yourself to be extraordinarily strong along the way, you're going to be extraordinarily big. There's really no way, shape, or form. You might not be the biggest guy. You might not turn into Flex Wheeler or Ronnie Coleman, but if you get to the point where you're doing sets of 500-pound squats for 8 or 10 reps, and you're, you know, you've got 365 on the bar for incline presses, and you're deadlifting five or 600 pounds off the floor, you're going to be a big dude. You're going to stand out. You might not be 300 pounds big, but you're going to be large. It's going to happen within whatever the, uh, the limitations your genetics are. So the idea is, is focused really on that. That's the thing that people um, sometimes balk at because that's a brutal way to approach training. It's not always, unless you're so uh, sort of, mentally constructed to want to go into the gym and tackle things in that fashion. Like every day you have this log book looking at you saying, come on, show me what a push you are. <laughs> I'm going to kick your ass today unless you get ready for this. The idea was to beat the log book every single day on every single exercise if possible. Then DC training might not work for you. But that's really, I think, and this is one of the questions I think we're going to ask is what I think is probably the most important aspect of training is some sort of progressive overload, particularly in the, in the area of loading, of using heavier and heavier loads. Um, it's going to have to happen one way or another, and we can talk more about that. 
So DC training is basically, um, there's two main versions he's got out on the web, and there's another that he had it a few years ago, but it's a, either a two-way or a three-way split. So basically an upper versus lower body or a legs push-pull split. In the upper lower, you train three times a week, come Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for instance. You just keep alternating between upper and lower training sessions. And in the three-way split, you do the legs push-pull, you train four times a week. He's got different set types basically in there, which is what I've got in 42 trainings. Straight sets, rest pause sets, which are a type of cluster set where you do pick a load you can get for a total of maybe 12 to 15 reps or maybe a little bit higher. There's some variations in there depending on muscle group. And you take a set to failure anywhere between like maybe 10 or 12 reps. Give yourself 12 to 15 breaths of, of rest and do another set to failure. It might be three or four reps, two or three. And then do a... a another 12 to 15 breaths, and then do a final set to failure. And then you do another 12 to 15 breaths and do some sort of a, of a pulsed negative or a static hold with that weight. Yeah, those can be pretty tough. The idea is to hold for at least 30 seconds. That's almost, almost never happens. So let's say you're doing like a, you're on a Smith machine, safer way to do it, and you do, you might do 11 reps to failure. And actually one of the important things here, this is a, a nuance, but You'd want to uh, finish a negative. This is why a spotter is absolutely vital. So let's say you're 11th rep, you push it up two thirds of the way and uh, you can't lock the, lock the load out. Um, or even if, you, even if you get, let's say you get four fifths of the way, but you don't quite lock it out, you still would do that negative at the end and let your partner pull the weight up. And then you would start the next set with the negative. So let's say that's only three reps. So you go negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and then part of a positive, and then you get the extra negative on the end. So compare that with starting with the concentric, and you end up with more eccentric or negative loading when you start with a negative. So that's an important piece, is you can end up getting two or three more reps that are negative with heavy loads where you're near failure if you always start with an eccentric. So that's why a partner will lift that up for you. And then, of course, that static or that pulsed static where you just start at the beginning, at the, at the end of range of motion, and just do the lowering as long as you can. Those are pretty brutal. So that's a rest pause set in, in brief. Only certain exercises lend themselves to that. You would want to do that with a, a barbell squat. Just you're not going to be able to get, it's just too dangerous. You wouldn't do it with a deadlift or something like that. So that's the essence of DC training. All the details are an intense bustle. Dot com. That's sort of been the home of dog crap training. There's sticky threads in the dog pound forum that tell you how to do that. So, yeah, unless you've done it, you know, that was the interesting thing with the, um, with that video that I was talking about. I think I talked about this on the Muscle Minds podcast is uh, people can listen to that podcast. And, like maybe you can link them to that when we get this one out and people can kind of hear the criticism there. But it's a phenomenal program. I did DC training sort of the formal, what you see online for years and years and years. I was training with Dave Henry and I had been doing DC training before that on and off. Trained with him, him for a little while and then I got him hooked up with Dante. So Dante trained Dave for a while and I got to follow along because I was just the third wheel there. You know, Dave obviously was the, you know, the guy who was making money at this and I'm just, you know, a guy sort of a, just happy to be training with the pro, especially someone who looks like Dave. And then, uh, you know, I was helping Dave with sort of the, the contest prep types of things kind of from the get-go, we talk about stuff and share ideas. And uh, then eventually, uh, Twist of Fate made it such that Dante made me his, his formal, official DC trainer for years. So I was taking on clients and doing DC training with them. And there's really, there's general principles that are there, but there are lots of things that Dante has people do. He's worked with Cedric McMillan a little bit. Um, he's, had Don, he's had Dave do some things that you won't see on the boards necessarily. He's talked, with, talked about the things he did with Cedric. He's got some ideas, and he's now teamed up with Dusty Hanshaw. It's been, there's been some crickets because I haven't heard what's going to happen. They, they sort of made some announcements maybe six, nine months ago, I think, about them uh, sort of bringing DC training back, on to, back to the forefront, but I haven't seen what they're doing, so maybe they're uh, you know, making us wait a little bit, so we'll be excited about the launch. But um, hopefully that makes its way out because it's a phenomenal program. But I learned a lot from that. I had to change some things. I... I twisted some things around. And so that was really a, the basis of a lot of my training. And probably for, before I started doing fortitude training, probably for the three or four years before that, I was playing around with a lot of the things that made its way into fortitude training. 
that were in a DC training sort of backdrop. Um, but I wasn't doing the strict two way or three way split because I was, I had some injuries that I learned some things from. There's a, there's a tremendous amount that I picked up on just figuring out how to continue with that sort of progressive overload, beat the logbook mindset, but keep from destroying myself in the process, including my nervous system, which I think maybe we'll talk about today too. So that's a long winded answer about DC training. There's a lot to unpack there and, um, there's definitely a tremendous value in, um, having some sort of a written uh, training log. I usually use my phone, but um, yeah, <laughs> I find it that's easier and uh, kind of more uh, fail-proof, I guess, because I already lost a logbook a while ago. Oh, the paper one, yeah. So that happened once. It's unpleasant, so I usually use the, my phone, but uh, yeah, if you don't log it at all, it's, uh, it's kind of frustrating when I have to explain to people why there's value in that. It's astonishing for me that I even have to explain that that would be uh, something uh, valuable to consider. But specifically to DC training, it's often referenced as a low volume program. And I think I first heard, because Dante is obviously... Like, I'm 23 years old, so I started lifting in 2011, so Dante is not my, kind of not my generation, and not many people know about DC training, particularly here in Romania, but um, I think I heard Live McDonald say something about Dante and DC being a reasonable program, in that it had reasonable volume, it had reasonable frequency, it had an emphasis on progressively lifting heavy weights, mm -hmm. so it had kind of all the critical elements ticked off. So is it a low volume program? Because um, there was a debate. I don't know if you've seen it. It was actually in Beast Radio with Austin and uh, and Alex Keichel. So they had a debate between uh, Mike Israel and um, Victor Black. Victor Black, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a debate between well, essentially low versus high volume training, and it was a bit intellectually frustrating because <laughs> he kept interrupting Mike. But uh, he defined low volume training as between ten to fourteen sets per week, and that's by that's not a low volume training by any means. So uh, when people talk about low volume, they talk about doing maybe a set or two per muscle group, maybe twice per week. So maybe four sets at tops. But I've even seen recommendations ranging up to even a set per week. So you do a set per muscle group per week and that's it. And that would be a low volume workout. So 14 sets per week, that's, that's, uh, that's considered high volume by many people. So what are the usual volume ranges in DC training? And maybe we can transition to 42, how you've implemented the, the principles and how the volume translates into your uh, outline, I guess. Yeah, that's a, that's a good setup for one of the, that's one of the things I recognized with DC training is that there's a tremendous variability in terms of recovery abilities. And that what might be low volume for one person is high volume for someone else. And to a certain degree, that's a function of how hard they train and what those sets mean. I mean, you can watch the majority of people, if you watch someone in the gym, they'll do a set and maybe they say they do 10 reps. And it's only like that ninth or 10th rep where there's much of a sign of any effort. You know, if you did a rating of perceived exertion, you know, on like a, a Borg scale from zero to 10, they might reach a seven or an eight and then they just stop because they don't want to go beyond that. So you can do lots of sets that way. You can do a substantial number of sets that way. And then there are people that train like their life depends upon it. There's a gun to their head. You know, they've got a family member who's going to be executed if they don't get 15 reps. And they will do it. It will happen. Um, there was a thread, actually, John Meadows just started a few days ago on Facebook. Of, like, what was the hardest set you ever, ever did? And yeah, I've seen start, that. Yeah, you saw that. And people, one of the themes that was like a sub-theme there is people were giving the context in which that set occurred. And like, remember one guy said, I think his, his grandmother had passed away. Um, and another guy said his girlfriend had just broken up with him. So they had some emotional force. They had some emotional thrust behind those particular days, those particular sets where they just wanted to let loose. So some people train like that. It's an emotional therapeutic outlet to do that. They're releasing anger and everything else. You know, Kai Green's famous for speech that he did, I think Mike Polchinello filmed this, where he talked about, you know, um, training how Ronnie does, there's got to be some, there's violence behind that, you know, so training that way compared to just sort of, you know, making your way through and, and just like training until like the rep speed starts to slow down, 
world of difference, world of difference there. So, you know, if you want to like, you know, break things up in a low, medium and high volume, DC training is a relatively low training program in terms of the work sets, but the warm up sets can, can accrue some volume and it kind of depends on how you do that. So if, especially if you're a big, strong guy, let's say you're going to use a, a 365 pound load for an incline press. And so that person might do 15 or 20 reps with 135. They might do 12 or 15 with two and a quarter. They might do 275 for eight. They might do three, 315 for seven or six or seven. So some of those are, you know, some people do that. Some people like to train that way. And then they would go and do their rest pause set where they get, you know, eight reps with 365, the first part of the rest pause, and then three and then, and then two or something like that. So that's a pretty extensive warm up. They like to do that. And as long as you're consistent in that, it's okay because you're going to progressively overload having the same amount of fatigue pretty much when you go into those working rest pause sets. Sure, but that's not a set because if someone's going to call that a set, that's not a set. <laughs> well, but, but if it's one or two reps shy of failure, it, there's actually some volume being accrued there. So yeah, it's not a work. That's the thing. That's really, you actually, you pinned it right there. The, the question is whether they're warm-up sets, what can someone, someone considers a real set or a working set versus just what their definition of that is. Some people, I see them train, I'm like, you had four or five more in the tank. It wasn't even close to failure. Like, you know, you, you weren't even put, there was just, there was way too easy. But they can't get away with doing 15 sets that way in a workout, if they go all out, it's just not going to happen. They'd be destroyed. When it comes to DC training, roughly how many sets are we talking about? Um, it's not much. Like you would do, um, some people would add widow makers for body parts, depending on the person and how well they recover. So that's one variable there. But for chest, on a chest, you might just do one, one rest pause set. On delts, you do one rest pause set. Triceps, a rest pause set. Back, usually you do like a width exercise, like a pull down or a chin or something like that a rest pause set, and then you would do two straight sets, a heavy, and then a back off set, or you could do the lighter one first if you want to. Legs would be like quads or thighs would be two heavy sets, one lighter than the other, and the order is kind of up to the person. You can mix it up if you like. And then a widow maker. A biceps would be like a rest pause as well. So you're going to do on one day quads, or he calls them quads, but it's really kind of a compound thigh exercise. Two straight sets and a widow maker and then calves, as I noted, and then you do abs on that day and, and biceps, and that's it, you're done. Actually, you'd probably do biceps first. The other day you do back, chest, and delts, and tries. So it's not high volume. The, the premium here, this is where people look at it on paper. One, you've got those, those warm-up sets, but the thing that people forget, and they think, oh, this is nothing when they go into it, is that you've got to come back after you, you're rotating through three sets of exercises, you come back four weeks later, and now you've got to beat the logbook. And the idea is that you come and beat the logbook every single time. So each one of those are basically like a, a testing day. As an example, it's a little bit, little bit different, but you know, guys who have powerlifted a lot realize after a meet, you're wiped, you're zapped. You know, you only did like nine lifts or maybe less if you, you know, if decided to forego some of your lifts. You only, you only did nine attempts. So you did like, you know, most nine reps with your max weight. It's like a nine rep day. How bad can that be? But you're destroyed. Because those are pretty much, many of them are max efforts, even your safety attempts. So each of these sets is everything you possibly have. You're giving everything you possibly got. So it can be psychologically taxing and it's just overall physically and physiologically taxing. That's what gets you. That's where the progress comes. We will probably tackle this a bit later so we can turn, uh, return to this. But I think the real question is, do you have to train like that? Do you have to take every single set to eccentric failure, essentially? And... Um, Kind of that would be the disagreement Mike had and uh, probably I would have and probably most of the evidence-based guys would have. So um, we can return to this topic of failure uh, a bit later. Sure. So 32 training, how did you modify uh, the DC training to your own needs and uh, experience? I guess I could start. I really didn't just modify DC training per se. I just took some of the principles, a lot of them, because like you said, it's a very complete program. And the things that are different, training frequency is a bit, a bit higher. And I actually have two versions of the program that vary in training. Some people like to train with pretty high frequency. I, instead of using the rest pause style cluster set, I've got what I call a muscle round. And I just, I just use that term so no one would, no one would uh, say I was thieving it from Leo Costa. 
because he came up with that notion. Same thing with Dante. Actually, the rest pause notion was one that Mike Menser had. And Dante, and his was very different, but it was sort of similar. So he just called it a rest pause set. So that's a, a DC style rest pause set. And the thing about those muscle rounds is I am avoiding failure except for on one of six sets in the muscle round. Costa didn't, didn't really designate how you do that. And when I tried his program, and this is all documented in the book, I just was basically taking each of those sets of four to failure or pretty damn close. And I just destroyed myself. It was way too much. Hmm. So that yeah. was a big lesson I learned is that, you know, take, and I'd known this before through some other things, even from when I first started training, is that taking a set very close to failure has an exponentially larger impact on central nervous system fatigue and thus fatigue or a, a recovery of your autonomic nervous system, your endocrine system, your immune system. So taking a set to, you know, failure at 12 reps versus stopping at 10 is substantially different in terms of what it does to the nervous system, but not so much in terms of the loading on the muscle. So I constructed those muscle rounds in order to load the muscle to the largest extent possible um, while minimizing the impact on the central nervous system. And it's a long answer. Talk about a long answer. I can get into it. Um, but it's based on some evidence looking at the extent to which uh, muscle mass can grow in mammalian skeletal muscle. And some of the things can only be done in animals, but basically animal work suggests that muscle mass has a, a much greater potential to grow than what we can elicit with resistance training. And that is probably because if you try to load in a similar fashion to what these animal models do, you would just break down. It just wouldn't happen. You couldn't certainly do it to your entire body in this way. But the muscle can grow that much. I remember some of the studies that I've done, they've done in birds and with regards to hyperplasia and they've attached um, kind of weights to the wings of the birds and right. try to observe if new muscle fibers form that way. Yeah, it, it certainly does happen. That, that's the stretch overload mo uh, model that's avian muscle. Um, it's a little bit different perhaps, but the, the most, you can do a uh, compensatory overload model and this this is done usually in the the plantar flexors of rats so they'll take out the soleus and let the animal recover over a few days and they'll start walking normally it's ambulatory um, patterns sort of go back to normal they'll keep walking around as much so now the remaining plantar flexors the gastroc and the plantaris will grow tremendously 70 80 percent increase in muscle size in a matter of months so you don't see that with humans with resistance training you can also resistance train rats um, they put loads on their backs. There's a, um, a Wong and Booth has a study, and I actually recreated this model when I was in grad school, where they use electrical stimulation to train the plantar flexors, do calf presses with a with a rat, and you get the kind of muscle growth over the same time period in those rats that you see in humans doing resistance training. They've also done uh, training with um, a guy named Gagne, uh, who Jose Antonio did some work with back in yeah. the day. And he did, he trained cats, some wrist flexor work with cats. And actually there's some, it's sort of iffy, but there's some evidence there of hyperplasia and increased muscle size. So you see the same kind of muscle growth resistance training in these animals that you see in humans, which suggests that the proclivity for muscle growth is similar between the species, but you see a lot more muscle growth when you use compensatory overload than what you see with resistance training. And there's actually a, a, a tendon transfer study that I found recently where they used, I believe it was one of the peroneus muscles to replace a torn soleus. I have to go and look. I'm blanking on it right now. I believe that's what it was. And, and so this was a, basically a, um, kind of a very, very similar to what you're seeing with the compensatory overload muscles where a smaller muscle now has to take up the loading that would previously be on a, a larger muscle. And it, I think it grew to like like 60% in several months compared to the control leg in these humans. So human muscle can grow that way. So the, what this tells us is that you can't do that sort of thing. Imagine, imagine of course, you couldn't do a, a, a stretch overload model in, um, in humans where someone like walked around with a 50-pound dumbbell strapped in their hand. They probably would dislocate their shoulder. But I imagine the trap would get pretty, pretty dang big if they did that. It would grow, I'm guessing. Um, and you're not going to have people like removing their soli so they can make their gastroc and plantaris if they have one get bigger. <laughs> and if you tried to have continuous, constant loading throughout the day, 
in all the muscles of, of, of the body, it would be like trying to have an eight hour weight training session or something. You'd never do, you'd, you'd just crumble from that. You couldn't load like that on the whole body. So we can't replicate that. And it's the nervous system that's the failure point. Yeah, I wanted to say that uh, the obese people usually have huge calves. Yeah. And even my, my mom, she's overweight and she has some stupid calves. So I think that's evidence uh, for that, the continuous uh, <laughs> overload, I guess. Yeah, that's consistent with it for sure, without a doubt. Just carrying the heavier load for sure makes a huge difference. Are you familiar with Andy Galpin? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, so he is at uh, Cal State Fullerton and uh, they have a muscle physiology lab. And um, I've seen a post from him today on Instagram that um, they had an article, I think in Men's Health. And um, there was a quote that I, I even asked Andy about. I haven't seen a response from him yet. In the article, it said that bodybuilders have larger muscles than you, but they don't have larger muscle fibers. And um, so essentially all the muscle growth is due to hyperplasia. And I asked Andy, uh, Andy about this because not until recently, the, even the idea that hyperplasia can happen in humans was doubted. And right now we have gone from that to, well, uh, muscle fibers don't get larger at all. And all of the increase in muscle size is due to hyperplasia. That seems a bit of a brave statement to make. <laughs> the first bits of evidence of that um, are from the early 90s. Stephen Alway did some of these studies, muscle biopsy studies in bodybuilders that had a whole muscle cross-sectional area that was, you know, 50, 60 or more percent larger than the control subjects. I think they had biopsies like the deltoids and the biceps, but the fibers were the same size. But there's also evidence, you know, in other studies, um, and some of this may be somewhat muscle specific, that bodybuilders do have larger fibers. So the evidence from always group for sure suggests that like unless these bodybuilders all start off with really really small fibers and they did a decade of training just to bring them up to uh, average size which doesn't seem very likely that what happened was that as the muscle grew um, there probably was some hypertrophy because you see almost universally this is you know the standard marker when you're using biopsies that muscle fiber size increases you know, you start to see changes in myosin heavy chain in a matter of like a, a, a few days or a week. And then the fiber growth, you know, within the limits of the precision of that, of that measurement technique um, will occur. And not in everyone. It's variable. Um, but you can get like, you know, uh, there's Bob Starin has done some studies in the early 90s, 50 plus percent increase in fiber cross-section area in women. He did some interesting detraining studies with the same women too. So the fibers definitely grow. We know that. Here's the cool thing. And you mentioned the, um, the stretch overload work. The most impressive increase in muscle mass that's, I think, been documented um, in any study um, was one that Jose Antonio did. And he did a progressive stretch overload protocol where they would, they would load the wings of these quail um, I can send you this reference, and I could even look up the abstract just to get the numbers. But they loaded the wings with uh, a certain percentage of the body fat or the body weight, and then they gave them like a day off for recovery. And then they added a heavier load on, and they gave them a day off a few days for a few days of loading, a day off for recovery. And they progressively overloaded just like four or five weeks, and it was like a 237 percent increase in um, uh, muscle weight over the course of that time. And you get some pretty substantial inflammation and increase in water weight in the muscle initially. What they did is they had a series of a series of quail and they sacrificed them periodically along those 28, 28 days so they could see what's going on in terms of muscle weight versus fiber size. And the thing that they saw as they moved along was that after the first 14 days or so, I can't remember the exact time, time measurements, but what they saw is that the fibers stopped growing and they started becoming smaller later on in the stages of that months long period when the muscle was getting bigger. What's probably going on there, and this, this may be somewhat specific, of course, you know, we need, how far can we extend these findings? Of course, this is quail, these aren't humans, but, and that's, and that's a continuous overload model. So the weight's always hanging there. You've always got this loading. But at some point in time, you run into issues, metabolic issues, when a fiber gets really, really big. Um, so you've got to diffuse oxygen and nutrients from the capillaries outside the fibers into the fiber where they can be used. And the larger that distance, 
the more difficult that is. And a lot of your mitochondria are on the periphery of the cell as well. So you, you, you've got an ATP creatine phosphate shuttle to help get ATP and, and um, uh, phosphagens to and from the contractile elements of the skeletal muscle. But if you have a giant sized muscle, then you've got sort of, from at least from an ener energetic standpoint, a muscle that's got these diffusion distance issues. So it makes sense to increase the muscle mass, but have smaller fibers so that you have more capillaries per fiber or a, a better uh, capillary density relative to the muscle cross-sectional area. So you can get the waste products out and get the nutrients and oxygen in. So that's a that's a, a, a an important survival mechanism yeah and and what you see also in those studies with all you see in a lot of the studies with bodybuilders they have a substantially high percentage of type 1 muscle fiber which is the type that's more endurance oriented and a lot of those guys a lot of people who've been training you would probably say most bodybuilders probably train with a high volume approach which has a higher metabolic demand which has a larger metabolic stress component which would favor and favor fostering, it would foster and, and make it, it would make more sense to have more type one, more efficient, more mitochondrial dense muscle fiber in those muscles. So you think of the course of time, if the adaptation occurred in those bodybuilders, as they're training for years and years, if it in any way mirrors what happened in those quail, that as the muscles started getting bigger, maybe they had hypertrophy of the fibers initially for the first few years. They kept on training and training and maybe started adding to their volume, kept doing that. And the type 2Bs, of course, or 2Xs vanished, started having a lot of 2A, myosin heavy chain. And maybe some of those 2As started turning into type 1s if you were sustained for them histochemically. And you started having fibers that uh, were not so big and you started getting hyperplasia. It started happening. And that certainly happens in the quail studies. In the, um, it, it's been shown in the uh, compensatory overload that you get hyperplasia and it's also been shown the stretch overload models as well that's it's pretty substantial there the hyperplasia so that was going on when you're getting uh, smaller fibers in a growing muscles because you're getting more fibers we don't have type 2b actually the 2b myosin is expressed in rat and when they first started doing the myosin stains they would they were similarly acid labile so that's a staining procedure in the lab. You pull out the biopsy, you make slices, and then you stain it under different pH incubations. And they were staining similar to how they do in rats, but if you actually look at the myosin isoform, it's a 2X in humans, not a 2B. From what I understand, that's super rare in humans. Like we have, I think, I remember from Andy's lectures, like less than 5%, something like that. And he said that he biopsied an elite sprinter. He didn't say the name, but he said that guy had some... 30 something percent type to X's. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's highly variable. There's actually some, there's a, I think a, a Mada or a Mara, there's an Italian group that showed an increase in type twos in some bodybuilders as well. And they only had a small number, is maybe five or six bodybuilders. They had some interesting findings in that study. I can't remember them all, but they kind of, they were very different in terms of what they found histologically compared to the, uh, always uh, bodybuilders from the 90s study. There's actually evidence showing that if you do ballistic training, you can shift towards type two. You can do that. Typically, the more activity, the more you shift, the type two X's will go away. You get more type two A, and then you know possibly over time, it's a hard thing to show, but there's evidence that it can happen. You'll get more type one, but that's highly variable. You know, that's one of the things that, you know, probably you look like this guy I mentioned before, he was a sprinter, Dave Henry, he was a sprinter. God, what did Dave say? We just talked about this when we were down in Miami. He, did a, he guest posed at a NPC show that I, I co-promoted. Dave ran like a 10, 9, 100 meter dash or something like that in high school. In high school. I mean, he's 5'6 or 5'5 five, five or something like that. He's not even like, that's, that's phenomenal. That's like literally world class. So can possibly be to your advantage to have a lot of type 2s, at least as far as muscle growth. There's so much we don't know about muscle fibers and... I think technology is the real issue because we are kind of limited to the technology we have available. And maybe in 10 years, 20 years, we will have a technology to show if hyperplasia actually happens or not. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a tough thing. You've got, you can take biopsies and compare that with whole muscle. Um, but once you've biopsied a fiber, you can't, biopsy, you can't put it back and let it grow for a while. There's so many things that can be done in animals where you sacrifice them serially as a, of course, of a, a stimulus goes on. When you said the the largest 
muscle increase ever reported. I thought you were talking about humans. Jacob Wilson has some... Well, um, Ben Pakursky has said, I think it was in the podcast, that uh, low the stretch is essentially what you described, where you hold the... For example, you would do something like a dumbbell fly and you would hold that stretch for 30 seconds or something like that and you would do that after. I think the way Ben described it, it was you do a set, then you do, do the eccentric and then you fi- finish with a contraction. So you would repeat that like three to four times and he said that that technique produced the largest increases in muscle gains he has ever seen and that Jacob Wilson has done some studies that he was a participant in that's right there at you in Florida but um, let's just say that recently there have been some uh, questionings with regards to (laughs) the validity of some of the claims Jacob has made (laughs) that's true yep so um, I don't know how much faith we can put in uh, those results but nonetheless it's, it's in- interesting. In calf training with DC training, Dante has people do that differently. Calves can be notoriously stubborn. And what he basically does is, um, is kind of a, a sort of a modified, it's a stretch overload type of set. So you pick a weight, and there's, you could even rest pause these, but that's not the standard way to do it. And you pick a weight you could end up doing a total of maybe 10 or 12 reps with. It's kind of the standard way to do it. And you do a concentric, and then you lower the weight and you hold for about 20 seconds in the stretch position. I do that sometimes too. (laughs) Yeah, and then you do another concentric. So these can take like three minutes. What I typically would have people do is because, you know, how long you hold the weight can be, you know, hard to kind of measure because it it puts you in a pretty pretty painful state when you're doing these properly. I just say, you know, set your watch up, start your watch, and do a rep every 20 seconds. So contract up as fast as you can, about five seconds down, and then you'll have roughly a 15-second hold. And then go back up and five seconds down, slow contract and 15 second hold. And you just keep doing that until you reach failure. And that's one set. It's interesting to watch. It's kind of a, it's a good test of someone's uh, pain tolerance. Um, because you'll see it's, especially when people do that for the first time, it's very rare that failure is due to an inability to actually move the weight where they're like, they're struggling, you know, to push that weight up. Most people will just, will just um, abandon ship. They're like, okay, screw this, I'm getting out of here. And they just they just stop before the weight is, is not moving anymore. I did not get that much out of that. I did those religiously. I got up to using tremendous loads on my calves doing those. And I didn't get much calf growth, so that may just be me. Um, but I got really strong doing those. Some people, their calves just blow up doing those. So there's something I saw a lot of variability in as far as calf training, which thought was really fascinating. It's interesting and I'm I'm looking forward to where this uh, hyperplasia research will go. Andy's doing great work. Andy and his colleagues are doing great work and uh, I'm super excited to see where this will go. Yeah, I'll, I'll start paying close attention. I'm interested to see what, what he comes up with because there's just, like you said, there's an, an intrinsic methodological issue here in terms of following muscle fibers in humans, counting them. And he was on the Joe Rogan show, I think, was he not? Yeah, yeah. He was one of the, the select few people who actually are not re- completely retarded when it comes to nutrition, <laughs> who appear on the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you mean. There have been a couple of times when I just had to turn that one off. I'm like, I just can't handle this today. I'm going to have to listen to something that increases my IQ, doesn't, doesn't drag it down. So I think we touched on muscle rounds pretty nicely and uh, we discussed uh, loaded stretching and we shall see if uh, hyperplasia happens or not. There's this concept of video maker sets, I've heard it. Uh, how does that differ from the muscle rounds? Is that similar at all? Or? Widowmakers are, the idea is that if you're a guy and you're married, that you take this set to death. It's a death set. So thus you're creating a widow and that you're killing yourself and leaving your wife, you know, as a widow. So that's kind of where the name comes from. So the idea, idea there is this is an all you can possibly do set. And it, it does a couple of things. This is one of those things where you have to, I really think there's something to say for the perspective that comes from really, really hard training in terms of, of how you then gauge you know, your, your future training and how hard you can train in the future. And I've got a story that I tell about pain tolerance and perspective on pain that I can toss at you if we have time. But um, these widow makers are brutal. So a widow maker basically is you, generally you're looking for a total of roughly 20 reps. Sometimes they can be higher, which are even more fun. And you're going to pick up the load and don't put it down 
until you get approximately that many reps. So you, you'd have been logging this and you know about how much weight you're going to use. Um, and of course, you're trying to progressively overload week by week when you do these. Um, you can do them every third week as you rotate your exercises in DC training. You can do the same Widowmaker every week. Um, I actually did that for a little while in my um, prep this last year. I did some, just for old just for old time's sake, I did Widowmakers every week on squats. So a Widowmaker, basically, a, a strategy might be something like you, you pick up, uh, let's say, two and a quarter or something like that on a squat or 315, depending on how strong you are. And you might do 12 reps straight just to get some reps under your belt. And then you pause. You stay, You don't rack the weight. You keep the weight on your back. And you want to then extend the set out as long as you possibly can and get as many as reps as you can, taking as many breaks as you want. So someone like me, I tend to have the bar a little bit lower when I squat. So my low back will, I'll have to manage low back fatigue with leg fatigue. Eventually my low back will be like, nope, you're, you're done here if you do that. Some people who high bar squat, well, they can like totally, totally rest with the bar up on their traps. They can go forever and do these. So you might do 12 reps take three or four breaths, do three or three more reps, three or four breaths, do a double, two or three breaths, do a single, and you just try to stretch that out to get as many reps as humanly possible until you fail safely, you know, in a rack or with the spotter or spotters. So you could do that with different, different types. Of, so those are, those are just brutal. Those really tax your nervous system because you've got a number of reps that are pretty dang close to failure. You don't hit failure, otherwise the set's over. You, you take a break and then you do a couple more reps, each of which are close to failure. So what I learned from doing many, many of those, those are great. They, they, they create mental fortitude, pardon the pun, and they're a tremendous stimulus. You learn how to train hard doing those on a regular basis. You learn, learn how to be fearless too, because those are just looking at you, looking at you, you know, like I'm going to wipe you out. You know, it's a, it's a test of your grit. Muscle rounds are different in that I want to avoid, I want to get as much volume in. So there is something to say for the or volume versus strength relationship, but not have a ton of those failure points. So in a muscle round, you're going to do, pick a weight. It would be something about a 15 rep max if you did a straight set with continuous reps. But the weight you use is based on what your logbook tells you you used previously. So that's just a starting point. And you're, you're doing sets of four with either five breaths or 10 seconds in between. So you do a set of four, Put the weight down, totally rest. You're not holding the weight. You're not standing in the rack there with the bar on your back. You wouldn't even use back squats. You could do it on a Smith for a muscle round, but you wouldn't use a barbell back squat um, for a muscle round because you're going to fail at some point, possibly many times before you reach that sixth set. So you'd want to pick a weight. You get at least three sets of four, and then you'd fail in the fourth, fifth, or sixth set. And once you reach one failure point, then you drop the load down anywhere between 10 and 30%. That would depend on where you failed and how many reps you got. So if you get three sets of four and then you'd get a single rep and you and you just you die, the fourth one, you're going to have to drop down 30%. You're going to have to go down a little bit in order to do the next two sets of four without failing. So you don't want to have a failure point and you want those reps to be continuous. So actually everything in, in fortitude training, really kind of avoiding that phenomenon that you get in the Widowmakers where you're just teetering on that failure rep continuously and repeatedly that seems to be what what really zaps the nervous system that's something i just noticed and figured out rather with a with a muscle round you're going to have one failure point that lets you gauge your progressive overload if you know you failed on the second rep of your fourth set then you're not going to go up in weight because you're you could fail in the fifth or even the sixth when you can get all four reps in the sixth set that would be your indicator that you move up in weight. The one failure point gives you some indication as to how much that load was taxing you and how to increase. But you want to do still still six sets of four. That equates the volume workout per workout. So you're still getting roughly 22, 23, 24 reps, something like that, depending on how many you got in the set where you failed. And you're increasing the volume that you're using with that load while only having a single failure point. So you're you're optimizing once again the once again the muscle loading compared to the central nervous system stress. And then the stress is on the other bodily systems that are related to that. So kind of two ends of the coin, and whereas the, with, the, with the Widowmaker, you're, you're kind of accruing a whole bunch of near failure reps, and you do get some, it's pretty hard training with the muscle rounds, but we're trying to accrue volume while minimizing this, the taxation that comes with those 
with those failure points because those are what really whack you. That was a great outline. So that was episode 13 of the Muscle Engineer podcast with Dr. Scott Stevenson. I hope you enjoyed the episode and found it valuable and um, look forward to part two of this conversation coming out either later this week or at the beginning of next week. So as usual, I would like to finish the episode by summing up my own thoughts and uh, listing what I consider would be the three most valuable takeaway points. The first point I found extremely valuable was around the importance of logging your workouts and uh, the mentality of trying to beat your logbook every single workout. And uh, even though that's probably not realistic, if you want to build muscle, if you want to get jacked, if you want to develop an aesthetic physique, whatever your goals are, improving on your lift is absolutely crucial. As much as I love getting into advanced discussions and um, progression methods and um, writing detailed um, training programs over the long term you have to somehow get stronger in a set of basic exercises now these don't have to be the traditional big three powerlifting movements whatever over time if you want to get bigger you have to improve your moderate rep range PR so the 6 to 15 rep lifts have to go up over time and for that having a logbook and actually writing down what you did whether it be that in a traditional form with pen and paper or with a phone app whatever you use I don't care or that much but the important part is to actually write it down and um, try to improve it over time. The second point is around the value of uh, having a brutal workout and uh, like Scott mentioned kind of reconsidering how hard you're actually training when it comes to training I really like Ben Pakorski's stuff I like Joe Bennett who used to work at MI40 and he recently moved out from there I guess and I've watched some of the especially the leg training workouts they did together either Ben with Joe or Joe with someone else and um, I actually am subscribed to his website so I actually listen to the full thought process instead of just watching the five minute uh, YouTube clip and Joe pointed out numerous times that um, he feels like one of the biggest reasons why most people don't get exceptional quads big legs in general is because they train like a pussy essentially so they train way below their capabilities and Joe pointed out in a video I think it was with um, Cody Montgomery that they absolutely tortured Cody and the, it's not that you absolutely have to do those workouts to grow and whatnot the point is to re actually reevaluate how hard you actually can train if you decide to go there and then once Cody was on his own he can actually bring his average training sessions to a higher level thus yielding some uh, some new growth potential and I think that's extremely valuable and probably that's the main benefit of doing things like 20 rep squats and uh, widow maker sets on squats and what it's not necessarily that they are so much superior to a regular set and whatnot it's simply that they are so brutal that you actually <laughs> kind of ascend to a new level and um, if you're a dragon ball fan and you've seen this week's uh, dragon ball super episode then you know what i'm talking about and the third and final point is around the whole muscle fiber type issue and I don't want to point out anything specific whether hyperplasia actually happens or doesn't happen or um, whether you should train a different way for a specific muscle group or muscle fiber type I think that's the main point I want to drive home that we simply don't know obviously I don't mean me personally because I am not doing that research but I am following guys like Andy Galpin whom we mentioned during this episode I follow guys like Kevin Murek and Jimmy Bagley and um, other guys who are at the forefront of that research and they will be the first guys to admit that we simply don't know enough so at this point Anyone who tells you that they have a specific uh, 
training program design based on your fiber type and whatnot they are just lying especially if you are doing something like um, 23ME or another DNA test where you just spit into a cup and they just give you your fiber type breakdown that's bullshit like the only way you can find out your fiber type breakdown is to actually take biopsies and there are some big issues with that too because they might not be representative and I've seen some studies showing that your fiber type breakdown can vary within the same fiber so one portion of a single fiber can be a different type as opposed to the other end so it's just crazy so i guess the takeaway is that um basing your training on your fiber type is as of this recording is misguided and um probably something that doesn't have a lot of solid grants to it so i think i will end it here those were my top three takeaways what were yours let me know and um if you have any questions as always feel free to send me a message and look for the second part of this discussion coming out in a couple of days so until the next episode take care